Okay, you can come online. Um, so let's just wait about like four minutes and then we'll start at 2 p.m. Um, so people can start joining. So it's 2 p.m. So I guess um, I can start with the uh, introduction slides uh, while maybe some people still is joining. Um, so um, hello everyone and thank you for joining today. Um, I'm Esperanza, the microscopy, um, the community manager uh, of Focal Plane, the microscopy community site hosted by Journal of Cell Science. Um, if uh, you haven't heard about Focal Plane, uh, we created this community site for you to connect with like-minded people and also find resources and information uh, related to microscopy. So in our site, you can find, for example, news, interviews, posts, uh, discussing tools and protocols, uh, job listings, and a calendar of events. Um, our community site is free to access, and you just need to create an account in order to start posting your own contributions. So please have a look um, and join our community. Um, 
before I introduce uh, today's speaker, a few comments on how to use Remo. Um, so during the speaker's presentation, you can already uh, write your own um, your questions on the Q&A tab that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. And also, uh, we would like to have a more interactive discussion. So if you would like to ask uh, your question directly to the speaker, uh, click the right-hand icon um, at the bottom of the screen where, you, uh, where we can bring you on stage with the camera and microphone on, and then you can ask uh, your own question. Um, also, remember that um, after the Q&A, we'll be hosting a Meet the Speaker session. Um, this is your chance to meet uh, with Michael in a more informal setting and a group of maximum seven people. So once we finish the Q&A, uh, we'll move to the remote conference room and you'll find yourself sitting at a table. Um, here you can see an overview of that room. Um, you can interact with the people sitting at your table and you can freely move between tables. Um, so to move, just um, double click on an empty chair and um, that you want to move to. Um, just remember that there are different floors. So make sure that you're located in the first floor. Um, you can check this on the uh, left hand side of the screen. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael will be sitting at table two, uh, which is at the center of the room. And we also set up a um, focal plane and uh, meet the editors of Journal of Cell Science uh, tables. So um, if you want to meet with us, you can also uh, find us there. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Michael Lustin. He's professor of molecular uh, immunology at the University of Oxford and director of research of the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology. Um, I also uh, want to mention that he is also a member of the editorial advisory board um, of our journal, uh, Journal of Cell Science. Um, when we started planning focal plane features, uh, we wanted to invite speakers who have been making uh, great contributions to the field of microscopy. So either on technology development, cell biology or bioimage analysis. And in this case, Michael is a cell biologist and immunologist, uh, well known for his work on immuno immunological synapse. And throughout all his research, uh, he's been implementing different imaging techniques, uh, such as TERF microscopy, two photon microscopy, and more recently, super resolution microscopy to study this process. And today we're gonna learn more about how he's actually using these tools of super resolution microscopy um, to study the immune response. Uh, so thank you, Michael, uh, for joining us. And we're looking forward to hear your talk. Um, let me stop sharing. And then, yeah, and now you should be able to share your screen. All right. Well, thanks, Esperanza, for the for the kind introduction and. Uh, I'm looking forward over the next half hour to introducing you to the immunological synapse and a couple of uh, new types of uh, structures that we've identified in cell-cell uh, -cell communication in the immune system. And I just, you know, one note while this, this movie is playing, this is a movie from a lattice light sheet microscope, which is actually uh, technically not super resolution, so it's conventional uh, resolution. But by just going very fast and actually uh, kind of uh, providing a, a more detailed timeline, uh, it, it's still showing us things that we haven't been able to see before. So, uh, so that's important to keep in mind that a lot of the things I'll be showing you today are based on fixed imaging. But I think time is another uh, dimension in super resolution uh, that's becoming more important, um, especially in live cell imaging, obviously. So, so just to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, adaptive immunity, uh, so the, um, I don't know if you can see, hopefully it's, uh, so, so the uh, adaptive, uh, component adaptive immunity based on T cell recognition of, of antigens is mediated by the T cell antigen receptor and it's like in the MHC major histocompatibility complex uh, peptide uh, complex on the cell surface of the antigen presenting cell. So uh, this recognition process uh, allows uh, T cells to, to effectively recognize foreign peptides because of the developmental process that gets rid of most of the blatantly autoreactive T cells, leaves some weakly autoreactive T cells, 
and then uh, T cell repertoire that can, uh, where each T cell has one receptor that can, across that repertoire, potentially recognize, uh, you know, a, a very large number of potential molecular patterns that you would run into, uh, particularly in this, and this is in the in the, in the proteome, effectively of, uh, of of pathogens that would basically try to invade the body. So the system has a huge challenge in that it not only needs to uh, be able to recognize something that's foreign, it has to also be able to recognize something that's a threat to the host and distinguish that from things that are not threats like food and just like harmless environmental antigens. So uh, the way that the system, one way to think about this is that this recognition process is just the first signal that the T cell would need to become activated. And then the end presenting cell, which should be over here, is also providing a set of additional signals in terms of additional cell surface proteins called co-stimulatory proteins. And the, their, the level of their expression and the sort of like its distribution, its biophysical properties would basically be a second clue to the T cell as to whether this is a threat or not. There are also uh, soluble factors that are released into the milieu of the T cell interaction with the antigen presenting cell that will provide additional instruction to the T cell in terms of not only is there a threat in the environment, but what kind of threat is it? So, and, and finally, there's a, a, an emergent uh, category of information that's being transferred between immune cells related to microparticles. And these are uh, supermolecular systems that are on the order of uh, 100 nanometers or so in size that pack quite complex uh, uh, information that can be transferred between the cells. So for example, uh, uh, Alessia Lana, uh, who you know, I had the pleasure of working with uh, over the past uh, four to five years, has this really exciting observation related to telomere transfer between uh, antigen presenting cells and T cells. I'm not going to talk about that today, but there is a bioarchive preprint, and this is a paper that's under review. So we're, we're, we're really excited about this. So, so it's just kind of an example of the kind of complex information that would relate to T cell lifespan that the antigen presenting cell can provide to the T cell in these types of uh, microparticles. And the, the microparticles and their kind of uh, discovery and analysis through super, uh, super resolution microscopy is one of the, will be the focus of my talk today. Great. Uh, so this concept of immunological synapse goes back to the 1980s. Uh, and when, when people first started recognizing the uh, role of the T cell receptor in antigen recognition, uh, the, and, and the role of, say, calcium signaling in effector function, there were a lot of parallels with the, what was understood at that point about neurotransmission and neurotransmitter release. And uh, these images from Avi Kupfer in the mid-1990s kind of cemented this uh, concept as, uh, you know, that there would be a highly ordered junction between a, a T cell and a B cell, for example, that would have a, an adhesive ring and a central kind of a synaptic cleft that in this case is also contains uh, the T cell receptor and various uh, signaling molecules associated with the co-stimulatory co molecule CD28 that are basically concentrated in a very organized fashion. So this is kind of the, the initial picture of the immunological synapse. So now again, time is an interesting element. So if you look with the lattice light sheet, uh, 10 years, uh, or 20 years later, uh, basically you can now see uh, the dynamics of this kind of a process in uh, in real time and my computer, I guess, is just barely keeping up with this uh, video at this point. Uh, but, and, and kind of, again, it kind of cues in this kind of centripetal movement of, of these actin-based structures that are, that are uh, what, what are highlighted in this, in this image. So uh, since the, at that same time frame, mid-1990s, we've been uh, using a reconstitution system to study the immune synapse. And this has been, in this case, particularly useful in capturing and uh, letting us study some of these uh, particles that are involved in communication between T cells. So just to kind of introduce the substrate, you have a, a glass cover slip, uh, and it could be, you know, silicon dioxide, quartz, it could be you know, various materials that are like, you know, like glass. Uh, and you can deposit a, 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 an artificial bilayer on the surface. And if the lipid composition is tuned correctly, you'll get high lateral mobility of the lipids. So even though the lipids are kind of attached to the glass surface, there's a layer of water molecules that kind of allows both leaflets of this bilayer to basically show a very high uh, diffusion rate. And if you couple proteins like the, say this an anti-CD3 antibody, so CD3 is part of the T cell receptor complex and we use it to 
activate T cells in a population that has a mixture of different T cell receptors. So like you might get from human peripheral blood uh, <clears throat> and you, uh, and also the cetesian molecule ICAM-1. So when these are attached to lipids in this upper leaflet, those proteins will display lateral mobility. And that's what's kind of shown here. Some small fluorescent beads attached to the uh, a protein in the bilayer will display this uh, random motion. And if you record that motion over time, what you see is this uh, sort of uh, search behavior, which is a thermally driven search uh, that's on the order of the size of the of a cell-cell interface. So, so when two a T cell and an antigen cell come together, the diffusion of the surface receptors will bring them together, allow them to interact, and you then organize into these synaptic patterns, which involve thousands or tens of thousands of, of interactions between molecules on the two cells. And those are individual molecules, but maybe the number of types of molecules involved might be, you know, dozens uh, at this point, as far as we, we would know. Uh, so when you put a T cell, a live T cell on this uh, substrate, <coughs> you then can form uh, the immunological synapse very similar to what, what Kupfer observed. But now uh, the T cell is doing this essentially autonomously. So it's uh, using a, uh, a, a, you know, kind of a laterally mobile presentation of ligands, like particularly these two ligands, the ICAM-1, which is a ligand for an integrin LFA-1 type of T molecule, and the anti-CD3 engaging the T cell receptor or an MHC peptide complex will basically organize into this kind of pattern with the T cell over a, maybe a 10 micron uh, size scale. So, so this ability to reconstitute this process in a very optically accessible system where you're essentially on a glass cover slip and you can use methods like total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy allowed a lot of progress in basically understanding the signaling mechanisms involved in forming uh, structures like this and also how this related to the T cell response to antigens. So for example, we can put a GFP tag version of the kinase ZAP70 that's recruited to the T cell receptor when it's activated. So the T cell receptor lacks intrinsic kinase activity. It can only signal by recruiting kinases like ZAP70 to itself when, when uh, activation is initiated. And what you can basically then appreciate in a movie of, of one of these interfaces is that the ZAP70 in green, the green fluorescent protein, is being recruited to these microclusters of T cell receptor in the periphery of the synapse associated with small projections, uh, philopodia that are basically initiating the interaction and then essentially kind of collapsing into a microcluster that you know, keeps some of that sort of projection-like character in terms of actin dependence, but then translocates in an actin dependent fashion to the center and then forms this uh, uh, central uh, cleft containing the T cell receptor, which is actually in a largely inactive form. So you see that there's not as much green signal per T cell receptor in the center as there is in these small microclusters in the periphery. So I guess the, the so, the, so this is kind of the, our setup for the immune synapse. So in a way, one question might be, what are all these T cell receptors doing here in the center uh, that are apparently no longer signaling, but uh, are right in this kind of central component of the synapse that would be involved nominally in communication? Uh, and, and, and what are other effector mechanisms that would be uh, that, that could be released in this interface that we could capture and study using the supported planar bilayer system. And, and I guess, as you could see, basically, normally you'd have two live cells. Uh, and the, if there's something was transferred from one cell to the other, the receiving cell would, could internalize it and hide it from us effectively. Whereas in this planar bilayer system, anything that's received by the artificial antigen presenting cell can potentially be captured. And then if we remove the T cell can be studied. And that's that's a concept that I'll get to now. So, so, so our, my outline for this is basically kind of a dissection of this, the signal four type messages that T cells are sending back to the antigen cell. The antigen cell is also sending in the T cell. Again, I'm not going to talk about this today. I'll talk about two examples where the T cell is using these types of complex messaging systems to send information to a antigen cell or in the case of a cytotoxic T cell, what's referred to as a target cell because it's a cell that the T cell is trying to kill. Uh, so first I'll talk about synaptic ectosomes, which are the uh, this kind of T cell receptor positive component in the center of the synapse that are involved in T cell help for antibody production. Again, very important process for things like fighting uh, coronaviruses. And, uh, and, and then this uh, to make antibodies and basically to, uh, and also, uh, but also in, in, in killing of uh, target cells, and the supramolecular attack particles, which are a, a type of a cytotoxic bomb that we've identified 
through a similar process to the synaptic actus sense, just using, using the same technology. So, so we got clued into this synaptic ectosome, this, these, these kind of vesicles that were basically generated in the interface by studies with uh, David Stokes' group at NYU using a method called electron tomography. And, and this is a method where you take a fixed, you can take, you know, now it's very popular to do this with cryo electron, you know, tomography is a huge, huge area in structural biology. Uh, but, but, you know, with, with David, what we were mainly looking at is fixed specimens that contain cells from in vitro experiments where you have T cells interacting with supported bilayers. We develop methods to basically do aldehyde fixation and all of the EM processing, plastic embedding, et cetera, and then would make relatively thick sections of around 100 nanometers. And if you just look at these by standard transmission electron microscopy, it looks like a mess because it's basically too thick to get crisp information out of any, you know, you, you, you really, you, you need much thinner sections to basically get a nice looking image out of a straight transmissional electron micro microscopy image. But if you tilt the, um, the, the grid in the electron beam and then collect data, you're always collecting from say this position, but you'd basically be collecting at different angles as you tilt the grid, you end up with a data set that you can then use to, to effectively deconvolve a very uh, detailed three-dimensional image where basically it's like you have a, a stack of, you know, nanometer scale uh, sections that basically give you a lot of information about what's happening in the interface. And when we did this in the synaptic cleft at the center of these T cells, we could see the microtubule organizing center, which is a sort of a cellular landmark in the immune synapse that typically goes to this kind of central component. And then basically you can see uh, this synaptic cleft, this is the T cell plasma membrane. This is the planar bilayer here, are indicated with these red arrows. And then you have these, these vesicles, uh, actually the red arrows indicate the vesicles, sorry. So the, the, the red arrows indicate the these, these kind of vesicular structures that are accumulating on the supported bilayer in, in, the, in the center of the synapse. And what we recognized was that these, the reason that these vesicles adhere to the substrate is the substrate contains the anti-CD3 antibody or the MHC peptide complex, and the T cell receptor is highly enriched on the vesicles, which allows the vesicles to adhere. So, so what we think is happening in this situation is these microclusters that are trafficking into the central compartment basically are budded from the plasma membrane onto this uh, planar bilayer probably without actually having to disengage with the T cell receptor, without the T cell receptor needing to disengage from the substrate. So, so basically the, uh, the, the machinery that basically can make the vesicles is retreated to the plasma membrane and, and, and does its work right there. Uh, so one way to kind of simplify that information is to kind of build a model and, and, and what Koshik, uh, a postdoc in my group who was working closely with the, the Stokes lab uh, and Ami Lodra, a student on this, uh, was essentially to take four of those tomograms, four serial tomograms, uh, kind of align them together, and then build a model essentially manually by tracing structures that were of interest so that you could then kind of appreciate a little bit of a bigger piece of this uh, synaptic cleft and, you know, kind of like the organelles that are being recruited to the site by the T cell when the T cell responds to the surface. Uh, and, you know, I guess of note, uh, this purple structure over here is a multivesicular body. So this is a, a type of an endosome that contains um, core vesicles, which are uh, the, the, the a source, one of the sources of these types of extracellular vesicles. Uh, so we think there are probably two sources of vesicles in this compartment. One would be fusion of this type of a compartment to the plasma membrane, uh, which would then release these core vesicles and also this kind of process of direct budding of T cell receptor enriched vesicles from the plasma membrane to essentially uh, literally kind of convert the microcluster, which was a signaling entity into this non-signaling, uh, you know, what we believe would be a messaging entity that then is basically passed off to the antigen presenting cell. And, and basically this, this movie can play and basically it removes the, some of the cellular organelles that were identified in proximity to the synapse of the Golgi disappearing, and the centrioles, which would be the last things to go, and then essentially strips off the plasma membrane. Uh, this, these green structures are, plasma, are protrusions, actin-based protrusions that are still connected to the cell. The blue vesicles are tethered to the cell still in the process of budding off, we believe, and the golden vesicles are vesicles that have basically budded into the interface and are still attached and are attached to the planar bilayer. So if we remove the T cell, we get access to these, these particles. 
And so, so to analyze these, uh, Pablo Cespedes in my group, uh, who was also uh, the, you know, has been developing this kind of signal four model. Uh, so I kind of showed his picture earlier, but I, I didn't mention it at that point, but I just want to mention that now. Uh, you know, kind of developed this uh, with, with David Saliba, a method where he could put these supported bilayers on glass beads, which people have done, I guess, you know, the first people that we've identified in our, you know, kind of uh, work who, who did this was uh, the Kepler and Merrick group back in the 1980s with relatively large glass beads. And then subsequently Jake Rhodes uh, with these uh, four and a half micron glass beads, which are very cell-like and, and therefore, and also very amenable to analysis by flow cytometry. So, so we allowed T cells to synapse with these beads, which are now this, the artificial antigen presenting cell presenting ICAM1 and anti-CD3 or uh, ICAM1 combined with some additional molecules. And so what we were kind of interested in was seeing whether if we put start putting additional molecules that we know are on the antigen presenting cell and particularly CD40, which we know doesn't necessarily send much of a signal to the T cell, but receives a very important T cell uh, derived signal from T cell help called CD40 ligand. And when we, uh, when basically Pablo ran this experiment, analyzed what was being transferred from the T cell to the vesicles, and basically did this with and without uh, CD40, and also in this case, ICOS, but really CD40 is the key molecule for this purpose. What we noted was that uh, the content of the vesicles, and this is just kind of a heat map representing as a function of anti-CD3 density, you know, basically how much of these molecules are transferred at a fixed density of CD40 and, and, and ICOS, uh, and you get, uh, or sorry, ICOS ligand, and you get basically CD40 ligand and ICOS transfer, which is dependent upon the dose of the T cell receptor, but also absolutely dependent upon the presence of these uh, ligands. And that's kind of shown uh, here. So basically we, if you look at, uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is the transfer of CD154, and this is basically uh, with CD40. This is, uh, you know, kind of uh, without CD40. Uh, you basically have no transfer of CD154, of ICOS, of the CD40 ligand in the absence of CD40, but massive transfer in the presence of CD40. So, so this is kind of, a, it's, it's saying that these vesicles that are being generated by the T cell are being shaped by the interactions in this in this interface, which is we think a very interesting property. So the ability to capture these vesicles on these beads gave us the ability to also do proteomics and look quite deeply into the proteome of these of these vesicles. And there were a lot of molecules associated with T cell receptor signaling again, and the T cell receptor itself. Uh, many molecules associated with vesicle mediated transport, which we think would be captured in the formation of the vesicles uh, at the plasma membrane, as this is normally kind of an endosomal process, which is being kind of transl translocated to the plasma membrane. And then these escort proteins, which are the proteins that mechanistically actually kind of form the vesicles and butt off the vesicles. Some of those get trapped in the uh, vesicles also. So we found signatures in these vesicles that were very much like what we'd expect for other types of extracellular vesicles uh, like exosomes. Uh, but we believe in this case that these vesicles are derived from the plasma membrane, so we refer to them as, as ectosomes. And there's there's kind of a bit of a terminology landmine in this. Uh, one, you know, certainly uh, structurally, these, these, these vesicles are very similar. Characteristically, these tend to be a little bit larger, and we did find that vesicles that contain more information, as I'll show you, were somewhat larger. So, so just to kind of give you a feel for how these uh, structures basically sit on the cell, particularly the CD40 ligand before the transfer process, uh, we've used this airy scan microscopy, which is a super resolution mode that's uh, commercially available from Zeiss. And what it basically does is it takes the uh, light that's being captured from a laser scanning excitation of a specimen. And essentially, rather than putting it through a pinhole in order to get uh, axial and lateral resolution kind of enhancement, it actually maps the, uh, the essentially the airy disk of the uh, light that's being captured from the sample uh, onto a set of uh, detectors uh, in this kind of these, uh, this kind of hexagonal array uh, with kind of a, a bullseye-like uh, orientation, and and then a deconvolution process can get you a uh, you know twofold increase in in essentially a lateral and axial resolution, so that you and, and in this case improving the lateral resolution was very helpful for us in order to be able to 
look at these projections on the T-cell, which we think are the source of the microclusters. And, and they're kind of, so, so these are uh, images of T-cells that, that are in contact with these substrates. And in this case, we're focusing on the equatorial plane, kind of the middle plane of the T-cell uh, under two different conditions. So one condition where the T-cell receptor is engaged, but there's no CD40 on the substrate. And what you can see in this situation, the CD40 ligand in red is sitting at the ends of these uh, phallopodia, which are forming on the T-cell surface. So, so the T-cell has been activated. It's looking for a androgen cell to basically give uh, this CD40 ligand to, but because there's no CD40 ligand in the substrate, it's, we've kind of captured a situation where the T-cell is basically looking to hand off CD40 ligand, but can't find a recipient. So in this, on the other hand, in this situation, uh, when you have CD40 light, you have CD40 in the substrate, but you have no TCR engagement, the T-cell does something kind of really interesting, which is it hides the CD40 ligand from the substrate. So the substrate, in this case, there's an adhesive substrate, the T-cell is interacting with it, but there's no T-cell receptor engagement. So there's no licensing to transfer CD40 ligand. There's no reason to think that that antigypsin cell is worthy of getting the CD40 ligand. So the T-cell basically hides it inside the cell. And this seems to be an interest, this is an interesting bit of uh, sorting that's going on in the way that in the, in the T-cells kind of, you know, membrane trafficking system. So when CD40 ligand gets touched in this situation, it's internalized and hidden. So now if you look again on these lateral views, the condition where you have TCR engaged, so you've, the, the T cell knows the antigen substrate that it's sitting on is engaging its T cell receptor, so it has a good MHC peptide complex. It's worthy of basically receiving the signal, and it has the receptor CD40. All of the CD40 ligand ends up in the center of the synapse in the synaptic cleft in these in these vesicles. So, so again, this is a uh, you know, so it's it's a remarkably efficient system for essentially distributing the CD40 ligand to antigen cells. We're setting up a very extreme case where we have a very strong T cell receptor engagement. So it's basically providing all of its CD40 ligand in one shot. We think, you know, normally these T cell receptor signals would probably be weaker. The, the, the T cell would probably distribute CD40 ligand to a number of these cells that have antigen signals, but it would basically, you know, hide it when, when, the, when the B cells aren't presenting antigen. So again, kind of a very interesting kind of cat and mouse game being played by the T cell with the CD40 ligand and, and the antigen cell, only providing it when it's when it's warranted through a T cell receptor licensing process, but also you need to have the CD40 to get it. So Seth and Ballant uh, entered the project at this point and bought with them this uh, storm microscopy. And this is a super resolution method that works again very well on fixed samples that uh, provides 20 nanometer resolution, which is really perfect for the scale of these vesicles which are on the order of 100 nanometers. So where, whereas we could see the vesicles with the electron microscopy and we could do correlative light and electron microscopy where we could see fluorescent signals which were convention, had conventional resolution, so 300 nanometer resolution on top of those vesicles. So we could say, okay, the vesicles have the TCR, but we couldn't say anything about where the TCR was in the vesicles at that point because we lacked sufficient resolution in the fluorescent signal. Things like immunogold could provide some insight into that, but again, tend to undersample the antigen quite a bit. So whereas we, we thought we could get much better sampling with the storm approach. And basically what, what the storm does, storm, uh, palm, uh, ground state depletion, various methods for essentially getting at the location of single fluorophores that can then be determined with 20 nanometer resolution. So if you have a, a structure that you've modeled that basically at, it's too small to resolve that uh, conventional 300 nanometer resolution. Now, if you can make the fluorophores blink one at a time and you do that over you know, thousands of cycles, you can accumulate localizations for these uh, fluorescent molecules that basically give you a, an ability to resolve, much more effectively resolve this small uh, uh, kind of model structure that we set up, the, the logo from our institute, which then becomes uh, very crisp and uh, well resolved. And I guess this was the effect that we were hoping to benefit from in this case. So we took the vesicles that were released by the T cell uh, onto the uh, onto the planar bilayer after removing the T cell, and then uh, Stefan stained these with, uh, I guess he one of the one of our favorite kind of membrane probes in this case was wheat germ gluten, which just stains all the glycoproteins on the vesicles and gives you a nice definition of the vesicle uh, surface. Which again, because it's a it's sort of a projection uh, it, with with some uh, thresholding, basically you then can essentially focus on the uh, new, the kind of the equator of the vesicle 
that's you know facing you uh, as it sits on the substrate and adheres to the substrate. And, and then when Stefan basically stained for the T cell receptor, the CD40 ligand, what he noted was that these uh, molecules were highly clustered on the vesicle. And for example, like if you looked at another protein like CD81, uh, a general structural membrane protein in the vesicles would also be perfectly uniformly localized like the wheat germ glutenin. Uh, but then you, you could basically see uh, these uh, uh, clusters of both T cell receptor and CD40 ligand, and almost half the vesicles had both and they would typically, and they would tend to be segregated uh, in the vesicle. So, so this gave us an insight into the structure of these molecules in the vesicles that they were clustered, and and that essentially uh, this in, in half the vesicles, basically both antigen specificity and the effector molecule are contained in the same vesicle. So, so the vesicle kind of retains targeting information that's relevant to where the CD40 ligand signal needs to be perceived. So again, so we thought that this was a very exciting way to provide T cell help in a form that basically the B cell could keep with it and perhaps prolong signaling even after it had disengaged from the T cell. So, so and that's kind of our current model would be in the, in the, in the steady state, you have the cycling uh, of the CD40 ligand uh, between these projections and internal compartments when CD40 engages these uh, uh, clusters of uh, CD40 ligand. If there's no T cell receptor signal, it basically gets internalized. Uh, then it may come back out to the surface. Again, if it continues to encounter CD40 with no T cell receptor, it would get driven largely at the steady state into these internal compartments. If, if the T cell is seeing, uh, you know, kind of no signal or an antigen receptor signal, but no CD40, it'll basically keep it on the surface. So now when you engage the T cell receptor, uh, the T cell receptor is also uh, engaged in these types of projections. Uh, forms into these microclusters, which are sort of, you know, blunted projections that basically are, that will fit into that synaptic uh, interface, that the kind of particularly the more peripheral parts of it where there's signaling going on. The escort machinery then in response to ubiquitination of the T cell receptor engages the T cell receptor and starts the formation of these vesicles. And if you then have uh, CD40 ligand in the system, the uh, CD40 ligand uh, and, sorry, CD40 on the bilayer, You'd have CD40 ligand and uh, and the the T cell receptor basically being uh, co-clustered in these uh, projections, which then uh, butt off and form vesicles that could have both molecules. Again, in, in over half of the examples that we looked at. So that's kind of our model for the synaptic ectosome, which would be involved in T cell help. Uh, so Stefan then went on to basically ask, well, what kind of structures are involved in T cell killing? Because if you look in the literature. And this is a this is kind of like going back quite far back to the early 1980s when people again first started to think about this immune synapse concept. So you can kind of see why they would have started to consider this because you have these uh, the centrioles are sitting there again that that marker, and you have these granules that contain uh, perforin and granzyme that are fusing to the plasma membrane, releasing their contents, and those contents are cyto include cytotoxic proteins that can basically lead to the lysis of the target cell. So. Uh, so, th so this process, uh, you know, I guess in the past 20 years, uh, there's been a lot of discussion since uh, maybe the late 1980s of kind of um, uh, evolving of small vesicles in this killing process and whether, uh, again, eventually what would be called exosomes, cytotoxic exosomes would be important for this. And, and, you know, again, it's a concept that appears in literature. So, so again, we were quite interested to see whether, you know, we've, we've got a good method to look at exosome like vesicles and synaptic exosomes. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's what's happening with killing, although, you know, there was still some mystery as to how that would work because the cytotoxic proteins are extracellular proteins and the cargo of, of exosomes, except for the membrane proteins on the surface and the synaptic exosomes, is largely uh, cytoplasmic, so the interior. So it doesn't, it's not necessarily an ideal way to try and move an extracellular protein like these granzymes or this perforin pore forming protein. And those are the two main effectors that we're looking at, pore forming protein perforin, uh, granzyme, which once it gets into the cytoplasm of the target cell will trigger a caspase cascade that can result in uh, necrosis or apoptosis of the, uh, uh, of the uh, target cell. And uh, so Stefan was able to clearly identify these in the synaptic cleft for cytotoxic, for CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells, which again, so before we were talking about CD4 helper T cells, now we're talking about cytotoxic T cells, so their, their effector mechanisms are different. So they clearly were putting the perforin and granzyme in the synaptic cleft. 
So if we then uh, remove the T cell, use the same trick that we used to look at the synaptic ectosomes, we, we, we could see basically that there are these particles with perforin and granzyme, which were remaining adherent to the substrate, which we started to think of as these attack particles, these supramolecular attack particles. So the, these per, the form of perforin and granzyme wasn't like a soluble protein necessarily, although there probably is some release of soluble perforin and granzyme. We think at least half is released in the form of these particles, which can then engage the surface. And uh, the storm uh, type of imaging, again, uh, revealed that the uh, particles basically had a uh, kind of this, a, a core shell structure with uh, a, a shell of glycoproteins and a core of, uh, of, of, uh, of cytotoxic proteins. And, 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 it kind of, and, and this, is kind of, so this is kind of showing you that cytotoxic core in super resolution at the super resolution uh, level. And, and also by cryosoft X-ray tomography, uh, which I'll explain in a second, is a, a method to look at basically biological material and, un, and unfixed non-stained samples. We also saw this kind of shell of material surrounding a core as kind of the motif for this for these for these particles. And again, this is a, a quick introduction to cryosoft X-ray tomography. So this is a method that we're accessing through uh, the uh, uh, diamond light source. Uh, it's called the uh, B24 beam line 24. So Maria Harkielaki is a scientist who looks over this, and um, you know, uh, you know. So this is a uh, a method where they're taking some radiation off the synchrotron, which basically is these uh, soft X-rays, and focusing it through a uh, sample, which is a cryopreserved sample that can be maybe up to around 10 microns thick. And if you think about, you know, uh, electron tomography, uh, it would be very hard to. You know, Effectively, you couldn't go through a sample that thick. You'd have to cut a small lamella from it and then and then image that. But but the uh, because of, because the X-rays have greater present penetration, they can basically uh, provide details of the biological kind of organic material. So basically, carbon bonds uh, that are in the material in their distribution uh, at around 20 nanometer resolution. Uh, again, through a tomographic approach. So you tilt the sample in that uh, X-ray beam. Uh, and then uh, essentially uh, detect uh, the uh, image, image, basically what's coming through, and essentially uh, then deconvolve that, reconstruct a three-dimensional image. Uh, and so what, what Stefan basically observed in cytotoxic T cells is that uh, many of the uh, granules, the vesicles within the cytotoxic T cells seem to contain clusters of highly dense uh, particles, which uh, kind of stood out in relation to the uh, what would be considered the classical dense core granule that you'd have in a cytotoxic T cell that would release soluble perforin and granzyme. So he actually noted that there were these uh, particles, that, these granules that were, you know, somewhat larger than the dense core granules and, and much more heterogeneous and that they seemed to contain like an array of these cores with what seemed to be, you know, again, a very tightly packed a uh, set of uh, uh, dense shells, and that's kind of shown here. That what you're basically seeing is the voids, effect, effectively the lower dent, the lower uh, amounts of material that are in the core of, of these particles. So, and, and and the CTLs have, you know, roughly equal numbers of these uh, different types of granules, and and release roughly half of their perforin and granzyme as soluble uh, perforin and granzyme, and half as these uh, SNAP-like particles, which then can deposit on the say the grids that they're using for the uh, imaging of these uh, uh, you know imaging in general in this cryosoft x-ray tomography method we just basically coated the grids with anti-cd3 and icam1 or stuff and it essentially uh, captured captured the output by you know after after removing the t-cells and then just plunge freezing so so again we had this uh, picture and again we could do proteomics on these released uh, particles and we basically found a lot of the cytotoxic proteins, some chemokines, some uh, uh, cytotoxic uh, proteins that we expected, the perforin, a number of granzymes. And some of the proteins that kind of jumped out at us were these thrombospondins, like thrombospondin one and four. So thrombospondin one is kind of an interesting protein in relation to these particles because it has a number of cellular ligands, including integrins and the, uh, the uh, you know, kind of, uh, so-called don't eat me signal CD47, which is one of the molecules that helps protect uh, erythrocytes particularly, but other types of cells in general from being eaten by phagocytic cells. So it's kind of like a, a marker of self, maybe a marker of good health in some ways that you don't, 
you're not a good candidate to be phagocytosed and disposed of. Uh, so, so this thrombostanin protein basically binds uh, that, that, that kind of marker that would be associated with an otherwise uh, healthy cell. And certainly uh, a cell that basically upregulates that marker to avoid being phagocytosed would then be potentially a good target for particles coated with this protein. So again, we were quite interested in this, in this protein uh, from the proteomics. And Stefan analyzed the thrombospondin 1 uh, using the STORM along with uh, perforin and granzyme, basically did some very challenging three-color uh, STORM analysis and, and found that along with uh, like wheat germagglutinin, which was being used generally as a way to basically stain uh, bulk glycoproteins, uh, the thrombospondin 1 was basically appeared to be a component of the shell of these uh, SMAP particles. So these particles aren't just uh, balls of protein. Uh, they don't have a lipid membrane. They don't have well, really hardly any membrane proteins associated with them that we've been able to identify, uh, but they are uh, not unstructured. They, they have a organization to them where you have uh, a kind of a core of cytotoxic proteins and a shell of uh, glycoproteins, including uh, uh, thrombospondin 1. And, and again, the, the material composition, uh, again, we know they're glycans, I guess, uh, even in a way to say that they're, they're glycoproteins at this point is kind of an assumption. Uh, but, but I think we have a lot to learn about still about the composition of these particles and, and essentially how they, how they work for the CTL. So uh, Stefan was able to use uh, CRISPR uh, knockout technology to basically lower the level of thrombospondin 1 in, in cytotoxic T cells. And he was able to demonstrate, and actually this is a 60% reduction, was able to get basically a uh, 30, 30 to 40% reduction in killing uh, you know, by, by these, by these uh, cytotoxic cells by removing thrombospondin 1. This is the first time uh, that thrombospondin 1 has been associated with this mode of uh, T cell mediated killing. So, so again, it seemed like the, the following these particles gave us an insight into the role of this protein in, in T cell mediated killing. And again, we're still very interested in learning more about these uh, particles to be able to further uh, see if they could be uh, you know, used to better understand different phases of and different uh, modes of killing uh, that the T cell has at its disposal. Uh, so, so we know that these, it's a core shell particle. Uh, thrombospondin 1 is one of the uh, shell components. Uh, the core contains these cytotoxic proteins, quite a large mixture. SMAPs also contain chemokines and cytokines. So we're thinking that they could also have a role in maybe attracting cells to the target after the target is killed or while the target is being attacked. Uh, so kind of like a beacon-like role also. Again, I mentioned this down eat me signal. And uh, again, we're quite interested in the idea that you might be able to engineer SMAPs to uh, better target uh, cells that we want the immune system to attack in the context of immunotherapy. So the last thing I wanted to say, just to kind of bring things together, is that cytotoxic T cells can also use a, a membrane anchored uh, cytotoxic protein called FAST ligand. And FAST ligand is related to CD40 ligand. It's in the same family, it's in the TNF family of uh, proteins. So these uh, cell surface uh, trimers, you know, TNF uh, is, is one that gets, where the, gets, gets cleaved off and released as a soluble cytokine. CD40 ligand, uh, you know, also has that tendency of being cleaved. And, and the, when it's cleaved off, it tends, tends to be inactivated. Uh, fast ligand again is a is a really a membrane associated active in its membrane associated form, and it can also deliver, drive a different type of apoptotic cascade through signaling through this fast receptor. So we then modified the bilayers with fast and basically looked for new particles that might be captured on the surface in response to fast. And 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 you see basically without fast, you see uh, obviously no fast, but no fast ligand uh, left by the T cells. When you put in FAS, bang, you get basically these FAS ligand positive particles being released in parallel with the SMAPs. So, so we think that basically the, uh, these, the you know, T cells can basically uh, fashion uh, cytotoxic particles in this case, or helper particles in the case of CD40 ligand, in response to what they see on the surface of the androgenic cell, effectively in real time. So it's almost like they're, they're writing the message as they're interacting with the cell and then transferring the appropriate message for that cell, which would be in this case, uh, die through apoptosis. In the case of the uh, B cell receiving CD40 ligand, uh, you know, proliferate more and, 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 and make, make antibodies. And so basically, uh, again, so we think these are 
uh, you know, so we have two types of particles in the signal four category, uh, these vesicles. Uh, and the vesicles could be subdivided into exosomes and ectosomes, so ectosomes coming from the plasma membrane, exosomes coming from endosomes. Uh, you know, we believe the helper T cells are moving most of the CD40 ligand through an ectosome because it seems that it comes together with the T cell receptor only in the context of the, of the synapse. Uh, but, you know, exosomes can be preformed and uh, they can also be released into the synapse. So, so we think that in any situation, we have to be cautious about where, where we assume these things are coming from unless we can directly, you know, really visualize that. And I guess I think that's a challenge for the future with live imaging. Uh, so the fast ligand positive vesicles we're seeing, they could be synaptic exosomes or they could be preformed exosomes. And I think this is something that we're still in the process of, uh, of studying. But regardless, you have these vesicles in this case with many membrane proteins, structural proteins like these tetraspanins, effectors like fast ligand or CD40 ligand. And, uh, you know, you can have the T-cell receptor uh, and potentially you could have like the engineered specificity also being bought into play like chimeric antigen receptors. And again, so that's pretty much the, the, the talk I wanted to provide on on these new messages that are moving between T cells. I've, I've highlighted the folks who were involved kind of along the way. And this just also acknowledges some of our funders and uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks so much. I, I know I probably actually went a little bit over time, but I, I hope that's okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, that's totally fine. We still have uh, time for questions. So um, please start typing your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we have uh, one question already from uh, Rupali Gund. Um, she's saying, um, where, will we, um, where will the uh, microtubule organizing center be in synapse without the T-cell receptor engagement? Yes, that's a good point. So, so the, the T cells that in, in these artificial, in these model systems, if we don't have a T cell receptor ligand, they migrate laterally on the surface uh, if they attach at all. Uh, if they didn't attach at all, then it would, it would just be random. If they're migrating on the surface, then what you tend to have is the microtubular organizing center kind of behind the nucleus uh, and kind of, uh, you know, often in kind of a uropod like uh, kind of a contracted part of the, at the tail of the cell in some ways. Uh, and again, you know, some people, I, I, people have argued to me that, you know, really this, the centriole is kind of like the center of the cell. So wherever, wherever it is, that's pretty much, a, that's a switchboard for a lot of information. And, you know, where you put the nucleus sometimes is just a matter of convenience. Uh, I know also like Michael Zixt has done some nice work recently where I guess this kind of leading position of the nucleus is kind of an interesting thing because it can be used as kind of like a gauge for the, the porosity of the environment and whether, you know, if you lead with the nucleus, since the nucleus is the hardest thing to drag through a small pore, it kind of gives you a way to kind of gauge, can I fit through this space? And, and then you just kind of push the nucleus around until you find something you can push the nucleus through and then it's safe to follow it. So, so, and again, so, so, but, but essentially, you know, it looks like in the back of the cell. So sometimes when you see a migrating cell encountering a target, you really see this kind of dramatic reorientation of the microtubule organizing center because the micro, because it has to go from the, you know, polar opposite side of the cell to the interface and kind of get around the nucleus. So again, that, that, that that's been uh, described a lot and, and it's a very dramatic, reliable process. Um, let's see, we have, one participant that um, he wants to ask the question. Uh, let me see. I'm going to bring Lucas uh, to the stage so he can um, ask the question himself. Okay. Let me see. So let's give him some time. Let's see. Hopefully that's connecting. Um, this is a very fancy setup. So. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes you go into problems like trying to like bring people to stage. <laughs> uh, Lucas, um, double check if you have the camera and microphone on so then you can ask your question. Um, if you feel it's not working, um, just type your question, that's fine. In the meantime, while he's trying to connect, we have another question from Andrea. So, um, 
do you think the process is altered in exhausted cells? Yeah, so that so I think like um, there, there's some kind of old papers again, like you know this process of exhaustion has been you know kind of described relatively recently, uh, yeah, over right, right, the past maybe since 2006 or something, 2005 that time frame, but but you know it's been obviously you know if you look at tumor infiltrating cells, it's been happening all along. So there, there's some studies kind of like from the early 2000s from um, Alan Fry's group at, at NYU. Uh, so as a colleague, that's one way, one way I know about them is, is uh, that where they looked at basically two cells that were coming out of tumors. And I think effectively they described synapse formation by exhausted cells. And, and it, was, it was really profoundly defective. Uh, they, they saw like uh, uh, <coughs> quite an quite a, uh, elaborate breakdown of uh, T cell receptor uh, integrity and, and, and signaling processes and, and lack of degranulation. And then, you know, if you just took the cells out of the tumor microenvironment and put them in culture for 24 hours, they would recover the ability to, to kill. And I, I think that's, been, that's recently been reported for exhausted cells also. So again, it kind of, it, it, it suggests that, you know, so if you look at these papers from Alan, Alan Frey, F-R-E-Y, uh, then that, that kind of gives you a picture of, you know, at least at a, at a first step, you know, kind of like what, what do the exhausted cells look like? And again, it's kind of funny, it hasn't been, uh, you know, people, you know, another interesting paper is coming out or just come out in, in JCI from, from Max Kremmel's group, where he looked at the dynamic behavior of exhausted T cells and tumors and found that they're really, di they're really active. Like they really, so, so, you know, it's almost a little funny, like exhausted is kind of a, almost like kind of a, maybe a misnomer in that regard, because the cells are actually quite energetic and they crawl around and, uh, you know, they, they don't, they're, they're not de decelerating in response to antigen recognition as part of one of their, you know, kind of dysfunctions in some way, but at the same time, like this, they're, they're, they're turning on like a pro motility program kind of actively. So it's not like that they're, you know, kind of deciding by some default or some loss of activity that they're going to basically do this, you know, fast migration. It seems like they're actually stepping up their migration program. So, so this may be one of the things that again, kind of attenuates, gives them some effector function, but attenuates their effector function. And, you know, part of the flip side of exhaustion is that you're trying to avoid immunopathology. You, you want to, you know, it's a strategy that really helps the host in situations where you have a chronic infection and continuing to attack the virus would become deleterious due to immunopathology. Uh, so, so yeah, so yeah, so exhausted cells are really interesting. They, it's not like just, um, it's just super simple. Oh, I was partially scooped. Oh, sorry to hear. <laughs> so you, you've, been, you've been studying this also, I think, yeah. <laughs> so let me um, then read the Lucas actually that he couldn't um, ask before, and then I'll continue with the other ones. Um, so, do you think this process depends of a um, depends of a SMAP release is dependent on the rigidity of the target cell, such as more soluble release of the uh, GZMs in soft targets or more SMAPs in rigid cells? Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so right. So it's been reported that <coughs> that that basically there's a mechanical feedback associated with, um, uh, with, with, with cytotoxicity and uh, that basically even, you know, kind of like perforin insertion, based on Morgan uses work has kind of a mechanical component that, and, and, and tensioning the target cell membrane would, would help with that. And then recently from, from Dan Davis and some work that basically the uh, soft surfaces also trigger, trigger less degranulation you know, which, which fits with other work that, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, stiffness of the target will affect T cell receptor triggering and particularly maybe acute triggering because, you know, I, I, you know, some people, you know, have the, have the, have the opinion kind of that in the long run, when a T cell is basically dumped into a soft environment or a stiffer environment, it, it can kind of adapt to that over, over time, uh, you know, that it'll kind of, uh, in terms of uh, time scales of proliferation and you know kind of longer signal integration it can kind of adapt its behavior to work with different stiffnesses but, but that may be more difficult for a cytotoxic cell that, that really again at least in our experimental systems we ask them to react very quickly to the target degranulate kill uh, maybe only give it a few hours to do so uh, so that so there may be less time for adaptation uh, you know so we were looking at a very uh, stiff substrate, so we don't have any data ourselves on that. But but certainly, it's a it's an interesting uh, 
it's an interesting question. And, and you know, when, when environments, you know, in fibrotic environments or in, um, you know, kind of softer environments like the brain or something like, you know, you could imagine this is, you know, it could, could be modulating uh, what, what the T cells can do, like what the range of their, their function can be because they're in a, you know, they're, they're in an environment that's, that's very, you know, kind of um, uh, supportive of, 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 of their being triggered or, or not, you know, and, and the tumor cells individually become softer because you could be right a soft cell in a heart and a mm -hmm. stiff tissue you know does that then make you even a less good target because the t cell has all these great stiff you know very hard things to basically interact with and the tumor cells themselves are actually like these really soft objects within that so uh, yeah good good question so following actually uh, again like another question of stiffness are probably it's in the same direction on some of the things that you mentioned. Um, Felipe del Valle asked, have you tried modulating the stiffness of the bilayers um, or maybe trying another kind of APC with tunable mm -hmm. stiffness since Material. the T cells use yeah. the um, TCRs for mechanism sensing? Yeah, yeah, there's a paper, there's a paper that just came out <laughs> from um, the Klenerman group uh, at Cambridge uh, looking at putting, uh, and this is something that people have noticed you can do before. So PDMS, like one of, the, which is one of the common sort of uh, materials that a lot of people who do microfluidics and things used because they can, you know, it's like silicon rubber basically. Uh, so it has a kind of, it, it's, it has, you know, somewhat glassy properties and, and you can actually form bilayers on it really well. It's actually like we've accidentally done that when we're trying to fabricate something as a, as a container. And then suddenly you see, oh, cells are forming synapses on the container, you know, like rather than on the substrate that we were trying to get them to. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so, and, the, and, and apparently, and right, you can make quite soft, uh, you know, PDMS, I guess, like glass would be gigapascal or something like this is, so you can make things in, in like the kilopascal range that are, that are again, again, give, would give the T cell a much softer feel under the bilayer. And, you know, the bilayer is a complicated substrate to begin with because the lateral, there's no, there's no elasticity laterally, it's just viscosity. So, and it takes very little force to move lipids in a bilayer. It's just, yeah. it's, it's centinewton. Whereas the uh, if, if, it, if the cell tries to pull a bit out of the bilayer, on the other hand, you know there may be a little bit of softness or springiness from the bilayer itself, but largely it's feeling this you know kind of gigapascal like stiffness. Uh, and I guess with the PDMS substrates, they were able to get that that bilayer stiffness probably down to like a, a kilopascal range, which would be again like you know much softer, but still you know maybe not as soft as like you know some of your soft tumor cells or something. So. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I'd be really interested in actually ways to manipulate that in the, you know, maybe one Pascal to thousand Pascal range, you know, so, so that, uh, you know, what you can do with some hydrogels. Uh, and again, when people have used these hydrogels, again, it's sort of like, um, you know, it, it becomes, uh, you can get, you can, you can really drill into the details of this and it becomes complicated to basically do you know, maybe some cases like the proper controls because functionalization becomes a challenge when you get to really low stiffnesses. Also, you're also kind of depleting the material in some way that you're dealing with. You're making it sparser. Can you can you functionalize it in the same way? You know, so you, you know it, it's a you know a super interesting area. So, and I think I think it would be uh, it would be great to to be able to do more with that. Uh, one last comment on it, just just uh, you know, like if you look at uh, these microclusters that the T cells form, I, I mentioned that they kind of seem to emerge from protrusions that make contact with the substrate. And then as they as they move into the synapse, they kind of flatten out and become, you know, by EM at least, you can't really identify them as projections anymore. But if you put the cell on a, a kind of very soft, flat cell, like an endothelial cell, uh, you know, you see that basically these microclusters then re- assert themselves as protrusions and, and actually kind of punch into the, the surface of the cell, which is, again, you know, it's kind of a behavior. The endothelial cell is probably designed to accommodate due to like transmigration. And so when the cell cells start to probe them in that way, they, they kind of start to open up channels because that's the way cells, one way cells would get out of blood vessels. Uh, so again, if you could emulate that super soft surface like the endothelial cell has in an artificial system, it would be, it would be quite interesting, I think. Um, and so we have two more questions, and I guess then we close and then we move to the other um, setting in case like people want to continue more, more like, uh, discussion. So Emily Mays uh, says, great talk as always. I know you have described the kinaps. Do you ever see evidence of 
um, Europod based tethers that uh, precede um, synapse formation. Uh, Matt Krummel described something like this years ago. Um, yeah, so uh, the initial, you know, touchdown points that you'd see when the cells are just hitting the surface, uh, you know, I, I guess one picture of these would be these philopodia like projections that are sort of, you know, maybe short on, t on, on lymphocytes, they tend to be short structures. So they're also kind of called microvilli sometimes because they have sinus proportions sort of like a, like a, like a villus microvilli or something, but they're, you know, probably quite, quite different. Um, so in terms of, you know, we've seen cells that kind of, in some adhesive modes, kind of seem to tether through a uropod like structure. So they, you know, if you use like ICAM-1 as an anchor, ICAM-1 interacts with Ezrin, and, and when a cell basically adheres to an ICAM-1 substrate through, um, uh, no, sorry, an LFA-1, an LFA-1 substrate through ICAM-1 on the cell, you can get this sort of connection with the uropod that kind of then is, becomes quite stable and the cell will kind of probe around, around, around that. Uh, in terms of, you know, a, uh, leading edge structure that would basically match a uropod as a, as a way to enter into an interaction. You know, I think, I think cells that are in those types of interactions in the right conditions can basically convert, can basically rearrange that into a more of a synapse like broad interface. Uh, but the other, the other thing to comment on is that, you know, I think you can get some actin based protrusions that are probably not really uropod like, but on the dimensions of uropods, like they're large uh, structures. So a uropod might be, you know, like at the end of a cell and something, you know, it could be a, a few microns across or something. And then maybe also have lots of indications of like, you know, membrane topology and kind of quite complicated, quite contracted structure. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a paper a few years back from uh, Nellie Henry, where they, they basically bought beads uh, into contact with T cells, and then they were trying to measure forces exerted by the T cell receptor. But what they found basically was that when you engage the T cell receptor in a T cell in that configuration, that the, 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 the T cell would actually push the bead away uh, using a kind of a somewhat large, you know, probably uh, protrusive structure that was, uh, you know, quite actin rich, but probably not as myosin rich as like a uropod. So, so I think, you know, there might, there, it's possible that, that in, in crumble situation that there might've been some, uh, you know, kind of potential, I don't know, confusion is probably not the right term, but it would just be sort of, you know, you have something that's operating on the scale of a uropod, but actually it could be just a large actin-based protrusion. And you probably have to dissect the, like, you know, is it, row rich or rack rich and those kind of things like you know to basically understand better like okay, what did it come from what is it you know uh, when you have these kind of protrusions uh, from the cells especially you know when, when it kind of manifests as a single structure that is just kind of you know uh, pushing or pulling uh, yeah so so again so we haven't we haven't seen you know so much of a uh, europod leading I guess we would kind of uh, our, our experience is very consistent with like, you know, some old work from Michael Cahalan that suggested that these actin-based protrusions are probably the most sensitive part. So either the little, you know, philopodia or like lamella, like those are really good. They're again, they're, you know, the uropod's not insensitive. It's just the, the leading edge is more sensitive and the protrusive structures seem to be more sensitive, but it's a, like, it's something on the order of, you know, three to tenfold, not, not infinite, so. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we have one more question from Rupali. Um, the data with the SMAPs is quite interesting. How does perforin mix holes in the target cells if it's encapsulated inside a shell? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. So, so you know, again, anecdotally, it seemed like when when these particles adhere to the planar bilayer, where again, Stefan has commented that he can put them aside for twenty four hours at four degrees at least. You know, it's cooling them down, but otherwise you know, that they seem pretty stable, like any can come back without fixing and stain them. So they'll seem to sit around in that state for, for a while. But but we're, we're quite interested in the idea that this shell is, uh, you know, has some interesting properties uh, in terms of permeability. Uh, so for one thing, we can stain the contents of this map with antibodies without permeabilizing. 
like, you know, putting in some non-ionic detergents may improve the staining a little bit, but it's not required. And again, how it would improve the staining, it's not quite clear. Uh, we don't think they're lipid components, but there may be some peripheral, you know, proteins and things that would be opened up by that. So, uh, so yeah, so, so we think the triggering process would be really interesting in whether it's, you know, one, one thing that we're kind of, again, is, is interesting is that like the thrombospondin uh, has this really interesting calcium binding motif in the C-terminus. And it turns out that the thrombospondin, the piece, we actually have a piece of thrombospondin that's mostly in this, these SNAP particles that corresponds to the C-terminal 60 kilodaltons. And that would include this calcium binding motif. Pretty much that would be it. It's a calcium binding motif. And then like a lectin-like domain that binds CD47 and has a, there's an RGD loop that binds integrins. So it's got a lot of interesting interaction components, but this, this calcium binding motif is wild. It has like 27 calcium binding sites. And it, and it titrates between maybe like 10 micromolar and one millimolar. So, so it's just the concentration range where, you know, going from the endocytic compartment that would say not have calcium in the granule, they'd be very low, relatively low calcium. But then as soon as it's released in the extracellular space, it's going to see this very high calcium. And it's almost certain that it's going to change its structure a lot. So, uh, so again, that, that might be one of the activation processes could be and, and of course, you know, it's well known that the killing by these, by perforin and granzyme is, is calcium dependent. And one level where it's calcium dependent is the perforin docking of the membrane and forming a pore requires calcium. But it seems like also this calcium requirement could also be reflected at some, at some level and may, maybe the, uh, you know, change in the structure of the snaps that would let them, let them release their contents. Uh, yeah. So we're, again, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't. We, there's a lot we don't know about this system at this point, so it's uh, there's a lot to do for sure. Hopefully, for the for the next talk, we can know more about this. Um, so I think um, these are all the questions so far. Um, um, I want to thank you again, uh, Michael, for the talk. Um, I think now we're gonna just move to the um, the other interface. Let's see if people want to continue more the discussion like in an informal way. So thank you all for attending. Um, if you want to leave now the um, event, just make sure that you close the window. Otherwise, we're going to be appearing also on the tables. Um, so we just hope to see you most of them in there. So thank you again, everyone, for joining and see you there in a bit.